Hi, Susan. Hello, Eva. So you're going to be the host. There, there won't be any co-host, correct? Uh, I don't, I don't need one. No. Okay. <laughs> so let me just mark this down. I've got um. Hello, everyone. Hey, Michael. So we shall wait for our quorum. Okay, you're the, you're the host now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good meeting. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Just wait. <Thank> <laughs> So we're just waiting for Katie and Matt. Okay. Them another few minutes. Susan, yes. Did, did that thing we talked about, did you check? Is that in the bylaws? It's not. It's not. I don't think so. Okay, great. Um, let's, we do need a quorum, so I will have to wait for that. And there's Katie. We'll give it one more minute. Matt may be a little late, but um, actually, you know, it is now 5.33 and I, because we do have a training session that's supposed to start, the implicit bias training session starts at 6.30. I am going to, um, and Susanna is with us. Let me promote her. Susanna, I'm promoting you to panelist. Oh, excellent. Okay. Oh, hello, everyone. It is our November bylaws meeting. Um, it is November 14th, and um, we are here to discuss uh, a few main remaining points that were raised uh, regarding our draft, which is otherwise in excellent condition and hopefully will be voted on um, at this Thursday's meeting. Um, let me thank you, Susanna, for joining us so that you can present your concerns directly to the committee. I tried to do that last month, but you know I do not wanna speak for you. 
Um, let me just go through the three little items that you mentioned in your questions. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Katie, what's up? You can't hear me? It sounds like maybe she can't talk. Oh, she can't. Oh, I have to. I may have to. Um... OK, OK, now I've got you. Yeah. OK, she's, al she's always got to have two, <laughs> two screens. Um, you mentioned a few small things. Um, one was a lack of a definition of executive session. That's something that's defined by Robert's rules. So it's not in there as a separate thing. Executive session simply refers to the portion of a business session from, um, from which the public is excluded because it deals with sensitive material, which in our case is only going to be personnel matters. We're limited in what we can declare to be an executive session. And of course, our business sessions are governed by um, you know, the charter and um, and open meetings laws. So unlike with many with many boards um, in a in the you know outside of government, ours are normally open to the public. So that's why we would have ex a, an executive session to deal with sensitive things like per personnel. So um, let's see. There were two other. Oh yes, your grammatical correction in eleven point one. Thank you. I will make that, that note. And the last thing had to do with um, bylaws meetings being open to participation by all board members. Um, that would be true in general. I have a question. I have a question um, about 11.1C. Um, okay. Susan, yes. as a former grammar, grammar and Latin teacher, <laughs> which, which noun did, did you mean it to refer to? Did you mean it I to refer to, to the refer board? To the board, because the it, you know when then you then it's correct. Then it stands as as written because the pronoun always refers to the closest noun, and so yes, you're you're. I I agree with you, but you know I'm going to change it to the board so that it's unambiguous. That's fine. Yeah. No, that's and good. That yeah. That's why. Sure. And, and and you know if 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 somebody if a reasonable person reads it and finds that ambiguous then the real the correct thing to do is to change it out from being a pronoun to a to to a standard sure. noun. um can i interrupt for a second there's two other board members you know that we should elevate oh thank you so much i did not i am one and two and actually there are three there are three yeah we have natasha and valerie and and uh, Donna, there we go. Okay, and everybody's here now. That's great. Um, and the last item was yes, we um, it, participation by all board members. That was that would be true anyway because the, the the bylaws are something that affect all the board members. It's simply put in to encourage board members to participate in the process as it's as it's developing versus waiting until the end when they haven't seen it play out. Um, that's, you know, simply something to encourage participation. So those were your three question items. Um, I hope I've answered them. And the last thing is, this was your concern regarding the, um, the rights of board members to participate in the business session of a committee of a committee's business session when they attend the meeting. So why don't you go ahead and ex tell us what your thoughts are? Thank you. Thank you for having me at this meeting, by the way. Um, yes. So the, the way that the clause is currently written is that any board member, including non-committee members, may participate in the deliberations, which is the business session of any committee meeting. Um, I am concerned that this clause uh, undermines the work of committee and the reason we have committees, 
Uh, and I wanted to propose a change that would allow the participate that would make it clear that non-committee members are invited to participate in all of the public session. At, in my experience, they are given priority there too, um, but that the uh, their participation in the business session should be at the discretion of the chair. Um, the reason for this is a couple of things. I, I worry that if all committee members are by sort of by right entitled to participate in all the deliberations, First of all, there's a logical potential scenario that will never happen, but what if 50 people decide that they want to participate in the deliberations? 50 people now join the committee and 50 people is a completely untenable um, group in a committee meeting. That's the reason we have committees, even according to Roberts, that the committees are designed to be able to sort of tackle issues that are just too thorny for an entire board of 50 people to do. That's why we have a committee. Um, so I, I worry that it undermines efficiency. Um, it, and, and Robert says, sorry, I'm going to quote from Roberts, although I am not a parliamentarian, as Susan well knows, uh, in large assemblies or those doing a great volume of business, as our 50 member board does, much of the preliminary work in the preparation of subjects is usually done by committees. So if every board member could deliberate in every committee meeting, that would really undermine the, the efficiency that is at the heart of, of that concept. Um, I also think that it weakens the voices of committee members. Um, Committee met deliberations is where community members are allowed to have their strongest voice. They are one of a group of 10, as opposed to one of a group of 50. Uh, committee meetings are allowed to be more informal. People are allowed to speak more than once. We're allowed to have an actual deliberation, which is unwieldy with a group of 50 people. And I think that uh, opening the deliberations to anyone who wants to attend undermines the voices of committee members who have been working together throughout the year. They have a certain collegiality, a certain method of collaboration. They have a certain familiarity and expertise with the subject matter. And I think that this weakens the voice of, their, of, of the members of the committee. Um, I think it also undermines the responsibilities of the chair. The, the, the chair's responsibility is to make sure that reports and resolutions are clear, that they are well constructed, that they reflect perspectives, including from the public and the non-committee members, and the conclusions reached by its committee members. Um, so it should be at the discretion of the chair to determine when business sessions would be enriched by allowing the participation of non-committee members and when they would be hindered by doing so. Now, of course, we all know that non-committee members, it doesn't, non-committee members will certainly have an opportunity to deliberate at the full board. Um, so it doesn't cut off the ability of a non-committee member to participate in the drafting of the resolution, in the, in the approval or the, um, the wording of the resolution. We have substitute amendments all the time. Um, it would also not bar non-committee members from all deliberations because it would be at the discretion of the chair. I mean, I would say from personal experience, in most cases, uh, well, certainly I want, I mean, I think every we, we, we respect the idea that everyone, non-committee members, members of the public and committee members provide input, right? I mean, it is the job of the chair and of the committee to hear all input. Um, so in most cases, I think, uh, actually, especially my committee is a small committee <laughs> that is not does not have an enormous scope. Um, it's useful to have. Uh, oh shit! What did my? It's useful to have the the non committee members even in deliberations. But there are times when there are contentious issues, uh, and uh, my concern is that someone who might have a beef about something can you know can enter the deliberations and undermine the work that the committee does. Um, so I, I'm against that clause. I, I wanted to substitute it with one that allows, that, that reaffirms the right of all non-committee members to participate in the public session. I think that's sort of implied, but I think it's fine to spell it out. But I do think that the chair, the committee chair should have the discretion to decide who participates in the deliberations. 
Okay. What you want is to retain basically the standard that we have currently. Exactly. Well, we actually have nothing in the bylaws. And so what, what Susan and I, you and I have discussed this before, because this actually came up during a human services committee meeting. Um, and since the bylaws are amb ambiguous about this, um, we've made a practice on some occasions of allowing the chair to have that discretion. But now you're proposing a bylaw that would actually codify uh, the opposite of that, that, that the discretion, it is not the chair committee chair's discretion. Every board member has a right to participate in non-committee deliberations. And I think that that is, uh, undermines the role of committees. Well, currently the, what the, the, the bylaws are silent as to this specific provision, but what they do say is that the chair has the right to create such rules as that person sees fit, provided it doesn't, it's not in conflict with the bylaws or other applicable law. And that's that's the basis for say, my, my saying that, yes, a chair can let any committee member who attends participate. Um, and I understand now, I understand your concern. Now, just so you know that last month, I know you were unable to attend, um, but this was um, a point that was, um, I raised it on your behalf. It was discussed very thoroughly. Um, commit, the committee, the working group members and other people who were attending all had very strong feelings and there was um, a consensus that the proposed change is actually a positive one. Um, I will start by saying that I understand how um, a small committee, especially a small committee that works collaboratively can find the sudden introduction of new voices to maybe complicate things. But I don't, I think the, the view is that it doesn't drown out anybody. What it does is it may cause people to realize that they have to examine their, their perspective further and that there is a, there is a, a challenge to an assumption that you wouldn't hear except for the fact that there are other voices that are coming into play. Well, uh, I agree with that, but I think that that can be affected in the public session. And as we say, and I don't know if we want to codify it, I mean, non-committee board members are always given priority. I mean, I don't, I, I know in terms of practice, we allow voices from the committee and then we brought it out to non-committee board members and then we go to the public. So I don't think that that input is or should be squelched. I mean, I think it's very important to hear from everybody, but there have been cases where non-committee board members, and, and this would permit this to happen, you know, at any time, um, and any number of non-committee members, where they have come through the deliberations and not just offered an input on the subject, but also tried to make demands about what the committee should do. Um, so it undermines the authority uh, and the privilege of not just the chair, but also of the committee members. So that is why I think that there should be a distinction made between the input given in a public session, which is invaluable, and I think anyone who wants to squelch that is out of their mind, um, and the work in deliberations. That's well, I, I'm not sure if I, if I understand the distinction you're making between uh, a board member, you know, participating and making suggestions versus telling the committee what to do. I mean, it, it, it sounds like that might be something that's out of order that a chair could rule on as being out of order. Um, well, in my, I, I mean, if a committee member, a non-committee member comes and says, listen, I know you guys are talking in terms of approving X, Y, or Z. I just want to tell you why I don't think we should, like I'm doing now. Uh -huh. uh, but when you sit down to write a resolution and you're talking to your committee members and you're talking about wording and you're talking about what we sh what actions we should take, should we write a resolution? Should we not write a resolution? I don't think it is the purview of non-committee members to have a say there. I think if they want to have a say, they can absolutely say it in the public session. But when it comes to the deliberations, the business session of the committee, I think that the privileges and responsibilities of the committee deserve to be protected. Um, having said that, I think that in practice, in most cases I've ever seen, 
deliberations can be open to anyone. Many of our subjects are not hot or contentious, uh, but there are times when people have a personal perspective. No, I'm sorry, not just a personal perspective, a personal interest. I'm not talking about conflict of interest, but a personal stance uh, that they want forcefully to present. And um, as we know, you know, there are people on this board who have influence by measure of the fact that they've whatever been on the board for a long time, and they can undermine the authority of the chair of the committee, um, which I don't think is appropriate. I I, I think that. Uh, the committee chair should be protected from that. And I think that the committee itself, the work that the committee does should be the 10 voices on the committee, which allows for a strong, informal and productive session. And if, you know, the day that 20 members of the full board want to come and join deliberations, suddenly it's 30 people. Uh, and, and that's not, that's not a, an effective conversation. And it's also, it undermines the role of committee members who've been working on these things all year long. They've been working together, they have a working style, they have a certain amount of collaboration, and it opens up the whole thing to um, to um, a messy- Well, it's, it's I, will, I will agree with you. It is, it is less convenient, it is more time consuming, but what you're talking about is the, the I mean, we all know that board members have a right to comment. If they don't comment at the committee level, they're going to be, you're going to ask them to wait until the full board meeting when yeah. things have been drafted and, and, and the process has moved forward. One of the, um, the recurring ideas that I know I've heard um, is the idea that we, and, and it's a, it's part of, you know, CB2's philosophy is that we want to see people participate earlier in the process, working through things as they're being developed. And and it just, and of course you are right that this is an uncom the idea of many people showing up and creating something that is complicated to manage is the exception. It's not what we typically have. And I think that if anything, most committees have found that it is a welcome addition when non-committee members board members who are not committee members show up and enrich the conversation. But I'd like to share, yeah. I would like to hear from, you know, I don't want to speak in, on behalf of everybody. So I see uh, Michael has his hand up. So let me start with him. Wait, I just want to say one thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, Everything go ahead. that you are describing can happen if the non-committee members are part of the public session. The input that they provide is invaluable. Uh, and and uh, meetings can go incredibly long because the public session is long. That's when committee meetings really go long is if you have you know 50 people joining the public session, you want everyone to speak. So it's not a question of time per se, it's a question of undermining the privilege and the working style and the efficiency of committees. Sorry, now I'll see the floor. Okay, uh, yeah, Michael, please go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Susanna, for being present today. <clears throat> I try to attend the uh, Human Services Committee meetings whenever I don't have a conflict because I learn so much at those committee meetings. And I think it's really valuable for me as a non-committee member to attend because I'm not going to hear a lot of it if it's a report and not something stated at the full board meeting in the form of a resolution. So I appreciate the ability to attend. Susanna has in the past used her judgment in saying when she believes that non-committee board members should or should not speak. We did have one instance in which we had a very large number of people testify and a lot of discussion was occurring. That was the uh, proposed Chinatown homeless shelter. And I raised my hand during the business session and Susanna said at that point, we're only going to take committee members at this point in the deliberation because there are so many speakers. On the other hand, I attended a recent meeting and Susanna said when she introduced me, Michael Levine is here as a board member and we are going to invite him to speak in the uh, business session if he so desires. So Susanna has used her good judgment in playing it both ways in figure out when it's appropriate to allow a lot of people uh, to allow non committee board members to speak and when they should not speak. The problem, Susanna, is that not every committee chair will always use that kind of judgment in determining where it should be appropriate. So this working group, when we discussed it 
last time, last month said, we don't think it would be appropriate to say a blanket. No, it should only be at the discretion of the chair because we don't think every chair would use the same level of discretion that you have been using. So that was the reason we did not want to put that language into effect. We felt it would discourage non-committee board members to stop attending committee meetings where they can learn a lot, where they can contribute to the formation of whatever the resolution would be like and save time at the full board meeting. So again, I reiterate, we did discuss this at great length and a lot of us felt very strongly that it would be going too far to put this in writing that it's at the discretion of the committee chair because not every committee chair uses the same level of discretion that you do. Thank you. Janine. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to just say as you know, I think from I look at my notes from my very first month as board chair, one of the main things I encourage people to do is if you are very concerned about an issue, I want you to go to the committee meeting, because that is where things are discussed in detail. And if you can't make it reach out to the chair or send them an email because that we, we, the first time to raise something a concern is not at the full board meeting when it could have been dealt with earlier because that just makes that's where the bulk of our deliberation happens um so in general i don't want to discourage people from attending committee meetings now how it's handled i do want to say and i hear you susanna that you know some board members you know we have a lot of extroverts we have a few introverts um as and i personally am trying to do a better job of this is you know, when you're going to your committee people, you know, we haven't heard from, you know, Susan Kent yet. Susan, can you share your thoughts? And and I would, and there's gonna be, there's always gonna be that person, whether they're a committee member or a board member who's not a committee member, who is raising their hand three or four times. And I am very comfortable, and this is under Robert's rules, that you can say, look, we need to hear from everyone else if, before we hear from you a second time or a third time. And you can also limit the conversation that way, because I do hear you that there's some people who have a lot of sway or have a lot to say or like to have a lot to say. And I do think we need to, you know, as a committee chair, and I want to, you know, I think it's important to make sure all voices are heard on the committee level before going out farther and perhaps reining in, you know, sometimes people like to say the same thing three times. They only need to say it once. Um, and that might be another way to just in terms of managing the meeting. Um, and that's all I have to say on this. Thank you. Uh, you know, Susanna, you raised a, a something concern of concern, the idea, you know, that there are maybe members who have influence, you know, and can have an impact that is beyond what they're they, they should as simply a voting member of the board. But I I actually don't under, you know, I don't know how keeping people out of the process earlier on is actually going to you know protect somehow the committee um you know if people are if 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 somebody is 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 exercising undue influence that's sort of beyond the scope of i think what we can control um but please go ahead um, first of all, someone can have an enormous amount of influence and come to the public session and wield that influence, and that is perfectly acceptable and right, and and so on. When it comes to deliberations, you know, our bylaws uh, say that everyone you have to let everybody speak at least once. But from my committee members who are going to draft this resolution, I want to hear from them more than once, and the committee structure permits that, and Roberts recognizes that as well. Um, if non-committee members come and they are raising their hand over and over again, uh, it puts a chair in a very awkward position to say, look, I've heard from you, non-committee member, and I'm not going to hear from you again. I want to hear again from my members, the members of my committee. I think that would be very sour, um, a very sour situation. And again, Michael, I agree you know, not everyone may be uh, invite people into the deliberations, but it doesn't have to be the default that the chair um, bars people from deliberation unless the chair wants to allow them. It could be the opposite, that the chair 
you know, members are invited to join the deliberations unless the chair says otherwise. Um, and that would allow the chair the opportunity to use his or her judgment as to when those additional voices in deliberations only, I'm only talking about deliberations, where in deliberations it would be unproductive. And um, it, could, it could create where the default mode is that everyone is part of the deliberations, but it is up to the chair to decide if that's not going to be the case. And it's up to the chair to decide who gets to be in those deliberations. If we want it to be 20 people, great. If we want it to be the 10 people of our committee because this is a thorny issue and we have a lot to do, I don't wanna to have to distinguish between the non-committee members and the committee members in the deliberations themselves. That seems very, um, I think that would piss people off. <laughs> so um, I hold on to this position. I mean, I, I, I defer, I mean, obviously this, this is your committee and, and you will write what you want to write in your committee, which is uh, your privilege, uh, which I respect. Uh, and I don't mean to uh, to uh, do anything, you know, you'll enter into deliberations and I will step out. Um, but when this comes to full board, I'm going to hold on to this position because I feel strongly about it. No, first of all, absolutely. You, you should not be in any way feel that you're, you know, the, speaking here in any way should influence, you know, your consideration of presenting this to the full board because the full board is not here this is not a regular committee in the sense that what we're doing here is is working on our you know our bylaws are our operating documents and and I, and I've always tried to take the approach that you know I want to hear from everybody I want to get as much input on this because it it, it affects all of us it's not like a, a, a traditional standing committee. Um, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. And I thank you for that. I also want to point out that in Roberts, and I'm not a parliamentarian, as I say, I mean, Roberts says, uh, Roberts says, when a committee is to make substantive recommendations or decisions on an important matter, it should give members of the society, which I'm going to consider as the full board, an opportunity to appear before it and present their views on the subject. Such a meeting is usually called a hearing during actual deliberations of the committee. Only committee members have the right to be present. I don't think that that amending this clause to allow the chair more discretion would in any way inhibit people from attending committee meetings. I agree with Janine that one should attend a committee meeting and one should provide input because it informs the committee and it enriches its work. I'm only talking about what happens in deliberations where very thorny ideas have to be packaged into something that is clear and that respects uh, and, and reflects the majority opinion of the committee. Okay. Katie, please. I, 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 I have to take my copy of Roberts down, but I'd like, I'd like to, I'd like to think about what you quoted from Roberts in, uh, uh, parallel with the charter because sometimes you know some some things that Roberts say isn't we can't follow because the charter says something else but um I in think terms in of the actual, I'm sorry please go ahead and, and but I so I I just would have to put the two things side by side and think about it more um deeply but the other thing um about at the end of the day when the when the committee votes, it's the committee that votes, no Absolutely. matter who's participated in the deliberations. And the committee's vote is uh, recorded and uh, communicated through the, through the board. So, you know, in the board minutes, and that that becomes part of the um, official record of what happens. So, I, I'm not. I, I'm 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 thinking that that's a, a protection against some some of what you're saying that at the end of the day, it's the committee that votes and that that is what's recorded. Not right. talking about the messiness of the discussion, but I'm just talking about uh, what's communicated to the full board. Yeah, there's no question that the vo voting is only by committee members and uh, any resolutions or, you know, a letter that's developed is the product of the voting members. That's when that's doesn't change. Um, and I you know, it's Susanna. What you're saying is, I 
understand what you're saying. I am just, you know, um, I think that people's perspective, uh, first of all, everybody's perspective results from their personal experience. And what um, I've heard repeatedly in, the, in past discussions is how important it was to various board members to come and participate. And it has affected their, you know, how they function as board members. Um, and the idea that, well, I, I certainly respect the idea that a thorny issue is something that you want to maintain control over because it, it can spiral out of control because people are passionate. At the same time, getting the input at, you know, at, in a timely way, it's like, you know, you have to swallow the medicine, so you, but you swallow it when it's going to do the most good. And I, I again and again, I found that um, the, those, of, uh, those people who've been attending this meeting, and as you can see, they're not just um, committee members, have really strongly come out for the idea that it's a very, it's really important based on our philosophy of how we operate that we should that we should make this something that a, a right of board members. Um, but of course, it it I I respect the idea that it can make managing a particular meeting more difficult. It's it 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 sort of goes with the territory. Um, all I can do is you know, um, reiterate what um, what I've heard from the committee. Uh, if there's anyone else here who has not, you know, um, shared their perspective on this, um, I would appreciate hearing from you. Um, and, and of course, by all means, I do encourage you to um, raise your concerns at Thursday's meeting, present your arguments. Let's hear what people say. Because after all, the people who who are presenting a contrary view are the ones who are showing up here. There may be more people who agree with you. I don't know. I can only keep inviting people. I can't make them show up. Um, but you know, that's how, that's um, that's how we do things. You know, in an open in an open way. So um, uh, is if there's Anybody else who has something to say on this, now would be the time. Otherwise, um, I think we are, I think, I think we, we've addressed this issue. Um, we will, I assume we'll hear about it again on Thursday. Um, before we wrap up the meeting, I just want to remind, I did send everybody a copy of those communications policies. They haven't changed in quite a while, but um, it's something for next month. I'd love it. It would be great if we could wrap it up in the near future. Um, and I do. Oh, I have hands up. So let me call Matt first. No, uh, Katie, you can go first. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, Katie, well, you go first. Okay, thank you, Matt. So so polite of you. <laughs> when I was looking over what you sent today. Um, the speed at which things happened, uh, which things reversed themselves became obvious because what leapt out at me is how much we said, how much this, uh, uh, this uh, paper says, posting slash retweeting. Now, if someone could tell me if tweeting uh, is going to be, exist in, you know, a month, I don't know. So I would I would suggest that we might use a broader term. A uh, posting seems might might work better. I suggest uh, taking out a branded term because um, it's it's got date it got dated in a, overnight practically. We can certainly um, look at that. Um, sometimes though, branded terms become generic terms, and in this case, that's it? probably why it was used. But we can certainly reconsider any language like that so that it encompasses the concept without limiting us. No problem. Okay, Matt, it's your turn. Katie, what a, a brilliant comment. Um, that was really, I didn't really like that one. Uh, and Michael, I, th I thought uh, you 
uh, were uh, said exactly what I would like to say, but um, much more eloquently. I, I just wanted to offer Susanna the. I feel like we should vote on it. I'm, I'm an, I totally hear what you're saying, Susanna. It's a topic on upon which reasonable people can disagree. I, am, I unfortunately disagree. Um, so I'm, I would be a no vote on the amendment. But I don't know whether we want to formally even straw vote it, just to make sure the. I don't want to well, assume the support's not there and it actually be there. I was my only question. Okay. Um, well, what I can ask, I can ask. Um, the group, our voting members, how they feel about the uh, about the provision and whether or not they would like to keep it as is or not. Um, Valerie, your hand was up. Is it up or down? I'm sorry, I didn't want to. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, it was up. I was just going to quickly point out that I thought that the committee had voted on as I'm not a member of this committee, but I thought that the decision had been made on the inclusion or um we we did i was i was okay. just going to see uh, based on susanna's presentation whether or not we wanted to ratify it but it appears that um our vote is unchanged so um i'm gonna step out while you guys discuss other matters of your committee and deliberate i wanted just to very much to thank you for allowing me to address your committee um, thank you for coming for listening to me and uh, I will bring this up at full board. Um, I do feel strongly about it, but I thank you so much for the respect that you've shown me in this meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Okay. I'm sorry, um, did I miss the straw vote? No, we're, we, no, we, there's, there is no vote. We, we did vote on it last time and no one made a motion to change. No, no one made a motion to revisit the vote. So, Got it. um, if the language will stay as is. No, I'm, that, I'm totally happy with that outcome. So Susanna will will present and and this is the right way to do things. You know, something we uh, um, I want to give everybody who's got any concerns an opportunity to hear them. And I'm very glad that she reached out to me before today's meeting so that we could hear her in person. Um, so as I was saying, um, the only other things we have to address, I will send um, a clean copy. There will be a, 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 Matt, can you send me a clean copy? You sent me a marked copy. Send me the clean copy too. Thank you. Um, and yes, word? Be, I will. Um, in words, Susan? In word. Word form. Yeah. And um, yeah, it will be attached to the report. Um, it'll be, you know, there'll be a resolution recommending that um, this new draft as is, is, is what's adopted and replace to replace, instead of doing it as a cut and paste of sections, it's basically going to be a, a, a complete replacement of, of what we're currently operating under, much cleaner that way. Uh, yes, Katie. I, I, I know, I think we've talked about this, but now that we're at the end of the road, I just want to be very clear. Does this have to then go to the borough president for any review and approval, or are we able to do Not that, that I'm aware of. We've never done, first of all, we've never done that in the past. This is, this is, this, we are in control of this. I mean, if somebody found something that they thought we had exceeded our authority, that would be a different story. But as for creating bylaws, it's like, that's a basic, that's a fundamental function of a board is to create its own bylaws. So, um, I, yes, Matt? Sorry, I might ask, I might, and my internet seems unstable, so I'm sorry, but um, I might actually second Katie's idea, uh, which is, I, while it's totally, I totally agree with you, Susan, that it's a normal function. Outside counsel is often sought in in the execution of normal. It just might be an idea to either show it to COIB or Manhattan Borough Presidents. I don't know. It's just not a thought to consider it. You know, at this point, not a not a hill I'm dying. We, we would be delaying the vote. I have no problem with you know seeking any guidance after the fact, you know, you know, our language was very, I was very careful 
we were all careful in tracking things like COIB language and things of that nature. Um, but at this point, if I reach out, that means it's we're not going to get. I, I don't think we need to wait for it, I think was my point. I think we probably oh. want to show it to them at just to because they did it. I remember they came back to us with something and said, no, you can't do it this way. There was like a two thirds vote where they were where they came back and they said, no, you can't do it this. I just it might be worthwhile so that we don't have an issue. That's fine. That's fine. Yes, Janine. Just going to say, I was on a call with the borough president's office on an unrelated issue, but related to our bylaws. And the general gist was, there are your bylaws. We don't, you know, like that's how they say, you know, like we don't override your bylaws. You know, obviously, there's somebody who looks at it outside council, like you're mentioning that, but just that there are this community board two bylaws. They're not borough president's bylaws, and there isn't a central bylaw that every, you know, there hasn't been a process where each board has the same bylaw approach. So that's it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, once once we sort of get these passed, there will be time to consider these, you know, if there are any concerns about elements within it. Um and uh yeah, this this is this we this is an achievement. Um uh, we, we you know to actually bring these up for a vote. Uh, you know, wow, I'm uh I can't believe it after all this time. Yeah, Carter. I, I was going to say, if somebody has a problem, they should be bringing it back to the board first. Optimally, yes. And, and you know, it's not like there's some higher authority. You know, if there's a problem, you know, that's why there's built in a process is built into this change for people to raise those issues to address or um, to raise if something is, in fact, out of order. But you know that that that's built in, and that was a something that we we very early on built in as part of this process, which was two different ways to amend the bylaws, right? Which was specifically for that reason. You know, we also we we also learn more about what can and can't be done when when it's brought to us first, when we first get to. Um, you know, work on things that may be, a, a, you know, brought into question. Um, but, you know, if, if somebody has, you know, anything, if they, if they want, they want to see comfort, you know, I mean, I have no problem, you know, uh, you know, I mean, it's a public document, first of all. So this will be online and anybody can share it with, uh, you know, anyone. And um, yeah, so um, I is does anyone have anything else they would like to bring up? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Matt, we have our taking, Matt, 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 you're taking my lines, so please. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, you know, seniority. He gets the seniority. Gets, I, 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 I beg your pardon. I beg yeah, your pardon. <laughs> okay, and we have we have our training in like less than fifteen minutes, right, Janine? This is what yeah. this is the conflict of interest training. It's the implicit bias training. That's what? tomorrow. That's oh, tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Oh, I made a mistake. Yeah. I don't know yeah, why. There might be another one tonight, but I don't. I'm sure there's another one. Yeah, there is. Yeah. You know, there's 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 lots and lots of those this week. I know. There, tonight is EEO. Oh, there you e -E -O. go. I, okay. My mistake. Okay. Well, thank you very much everyone um be can i just say something susan oh i'm sure. a yeoman's job on this and I, i'm going to speak for myself and i think for the committee you've done an amazing and i'm not just you know you know i'm not i'm not just uh patting you on the back for nothing you've done an amazing job and you really carried this rules the bylaws committee and i just want to congratulate you and thank you for it thank you, here, thank you. Here, here. I, and thank you everyone for you know for your voices and for helping me, you know, get this done. And, you know, I appreciate, I enjoyed, I really, I really enjoy it. It's been no, you didn't. Stop lying. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's kind of the nerdy stuff, but it's kind of, it's interesting. You made it interesting. So, but I have a question, Susan, what will we do with our free time now that the Bible <laughs> working group completed this? I work? think people have ideas about what my time is going to end up being. <laughs> I, I don't know how much, how much say I have in that. And, 
we we're not a hundred percent done. You right. know, as I said, we we I'd like to get those communications policies, you know, sort of locked down. They are really, I think, in a pretty advanced stage. Um, and if anyone wants to discuss the idea down the road of st standing rules, if there's if that concept wants anyone wants to revisit that, that's something <clears throat> for a future date. Um, but I'm just throwing it out there now. Okay. And if nothing else, I will. You, you um, know, Katie has jumped off, but I'm going to say it's much more pleasant to do this on Zoom than it is in person. Because when we had did this prior in person, it was incredibly painful for, with regards to the frequency to hash out things. And so I'm glad we're getting to this point while we're still on agree Zoom. With you about it. Well, we still have, well, we still have the opportunity to That's Zoom, right. absolutely. Um, okay, so it is now 6.20 and- um, So there's nothing, I, there's nothing, there's no mandatory for a president's thing tonight. Not tonight. Okay. Yeah, it's the okay. EEO is one of the three required trainings. Oh, that's yeah, there is tonight. That's what I thought there was. Oh, is it tonight or not? It, it's one of the three. There's one on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which is why all the <laughs> meetings were amended. I yeah, I I, I can really board work is seven days a week now. <laughs> I received a confirmation on today's session for six thirty. Same. Okay. Okay, so let's jump off so you can have a few minutes before that starts. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Bye. Good night. Talk to you. Good night.